right, so everybody, like everybody else, I'm pressing the continue button. Um, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, it's interesting with all the development that's going on in around Cambridge at the at the Science Park, at Addenbrooke's, on just about every uh, the, the station and Cambridge North, all the new buildings that are going up, all the expansion of Cambridge. It's sometimes important to remember just some of the great buildings that Cambridge has and uh, some of the historic buildings that Cambridge has and the, 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 the care and attention that they need to keep them in their, in their splendid state. So today we have a, a, a seminar and a talk from uh, Alistair Jones at Purcell, uh, Steve Allen and Dan Bull of Margie Carter and Jack Clare from uh, Holywell Glass, who were lucky enough to have um, been part of the team that refurbished uh, Wilkins Hall for King's College. Um, Wilkins Hall is where the CFCI has his annual dinner. So um, with COVID allowing in November, we're looking forward to seeing the, um, the fruits of their labours. Um, and Alistair, over to you. Thanks very much, James. Good afternoon, everybody. As James mentioned, we've had the, the great pleasure of recently completing conservation, repair and alteration works to Wilkins Hall for King's College in Cambridge. We started on site in September 2020 and completed in March 2021. And as been mentioned, it's a, a building that will be very familiar to all of us, firstly for its prominent location in the heart of Cambridge, overlooking front court at King's College, as well as the venue for the annual CFCI dinner and many other events during the course of the year as well. I'm joined today by several key members of the team. So we have Dan Ball and Steve Allen of RG Carter, who are our main contractors for the project as well as Jack Clare of Holy World Glass, who carried out the stained glass window conservation. Unfortunately, um, Paul Hibbert of Hibbert and Sons Stonemasons couldn't be with us today, but they also played a really important part in the project. So what I'm going to do is just take you through a bit of a history of Wilkins Hall, the various issues that we encountered when working on it and the solutions that we arrived at as well. And then we'll hear from Steve and from Dan and Jack on the specifics of their work too. So the nascence of Wilkins Hall dates back to 1822 when King's College held a competition for the completion of front court alongside the Gibbs building from the 1730s, which you'll be able to see over here, and then obviously the world famous chapel from the 1440s as well. And William Wilkins, the architect of the National Gallery, Corpus Christi, Front Court and parts of Downing College as well, won the competition. And in carrying out the work, he completed what is now the, the world famous arrangement that we now witness across Front Court at Kings with the Chapel and Gibbs Building and the South Range with Wilkins Hall in the middle of it, facing each other across the court, uh, across the court. and obviously behind the magnificent screen and Porter's Lodge, which Wilkins also carried out. So the work took place between 1824 and 1828, and the only change in the exterior of the building that has happened during that time are the rebuilding of the two lanterns to the roof, which were originally built in code stone, and then they were rebuilt with an oak frame later on in the 1950s. And this drawing here really shows off the, the construction of the hall and its familiar cross section. So we have a, a slate roof sitting above this wonderful timber trust arrangement, which forms uh, an attic void up here, then supporting this wonderful hammer beam timber roof with the various pendants and screens sort of hanging down from it, all surrounded by the, the Ketton stone solid walls with this magnificent full height bay to the center of the hall looking out north across front court with this amazing profile dome sat just above it. Now the building had some interesting alterations during the 20th century. These are a couple of photos of the interior of the hall from the 1950s and for those of you familiar with the, uh, the interior of the hall, if you've been to events and dinners there, then it might look quite familiar, but um, an interesting sort of detail that stood out was that the stone screen here, just to the left of the bay window, is now located at the other end of the hall, so down here. And as part of the, the building of the Keynes building, so the 1960s development just behind Wilkins Hall, as part of the, the weaving in of that new bit of fabric, that stone screen in the existing hall was taken from one end and installed back at the other end. So there's a complete sort of flipping of the layout of the hall, which um, 
I'm not sure it's something that we would get away with today, but it was really interesting to see how the hall had been sort of played about with in its history. So despite the, the caliber of the original architect and the craftsmanship of the existing building, Wilkins Hall wasn't without its issues, which uh, to be honest, I find quite reassuring in the fact that even the most heralded architects aren't perfect and occasionally have issues with their buildings. So I'm gonna take us through a couple of those issues that we encountered and the, uh, the solutions that we arrived at as part of the work. So firstly, there was a the question of external access to the hall, which was a real problem at Wilkins Hall. The, the main way to access Wilkins Hall here was to come out of a little hatch here to go up a, a step ladder, which has now been turned into a, a permanent cat ladder to go across the flat roof of Wilkins Hall and then to negotiate the parapet gutter of this little projection here before arriving on the, the south side of the roof. And, when you arrive there, you're confronted by these long lead lined gutters with very low parapets to the side. So it's obviously not an ideal arrangement for, for accessing the south elevation. And then if you wanted to maintain the north elevation, the only option really was to put a cherry picker into front court or to shimmy up the roof over the ridge and go back down the other side, which is obviously far from ideal. So the obvious solution to safe access to the rear face of the hall was to install a full restraint system, which you'll see here on the right, which we did trying to line up the constant force posts of the system with the merlons, which are the raised bits of the, the crenellations to the hall, so as to disguise their, uh, their visual impact. But we also needed some way of forming a route through the roof void to prevent people having to shimmy over the roof or, or get a cherry picker into front court to be able to access those front gutters. So we provided a series of these lead clad hinged access hatches on gas struts, which have their weights balanced by the gas struts so as they can be easily opened and closed to let people pass through the roof and come out and access the various parts of it and therefore give access through to the other side. So the rear elevation of the hall overlooks a service yard. So we had a fair amount of freedom in terms of where we positioned the hatches. But on the north elevation, which is obviously so prominent, we were much more constrained. So what we ended up doing is just tucking smaller versions of these access hatches in behind the parapet that sits behind the top of the bay window on the east and west facing roof slopes of this small projection just here. And we tried to, to get these as small as possible. It was a bit of a, a balancing act between making them visually as unintrusive as possible, but also allowing reasonable access for the, the maintenance personnel out onto the roof as well. And it's, it's quite pleasing now when you stand out on, on King's Parade and try and spot the, um, those new access hatches. They're, they're invisible now from, uh, from ground level. And then obviously we provided a full restraint system on this north elevation as well to make those north gutters completely accessible. Internal access into that roof void was a real issue as well at the hall too. So before we carried out the, uh, the work to put in the new hatches, the, the only access into that roof void was this tiny little timber dormer window that you see on that image on the left-hand side, which to be honest was a, a real challenge to get in. You'd have to sort of scramble up a few slates and then get through this rather sort of um, meanly proportioned uh, door, which took some sort of gymnastics exercises. And when you got through there, you were confronted by the, uh, the image on the right hand side. So these amazing timber trusses, but also the need to tread very carefully on the main sort of structural elements of the, uh, the ceiling with the risk of putting one's foot through the, the lath and plaster ceiling and straight down into the, the hall below, which would be pretty, um, pretty disastrous. And obviously you could only gain access to this first bay as well before having to climb through the next truss. And, with no boarding out and no lighting and only one means of escape at one end of the hall. That became a very, um, well, really a very unsafe exercise. And it also meant there was no real way of inspecting the roof internally as well, which meant that if there was a leak, such as these ones, then the first you would know about it is when it started to appear on the ceiling of the hall below. And these are some of those, uh, those occurrences that we found where the plaster behind had started to get wet and the paint had started to, to peel away. And if you'd been 
keen eyed at various events in Wilkins Hall over the last few years, and he probably would have been able to, to see this sort of steadily deteriorating paintwork as more water got into that, um, that roof. And once we did get access to that roof foil, it was really interesting to see how you could almost directly correlate the, um, the issues on the ceiling with issues with the slates immediately above. So part of our work was to, to board out the ceiling to the roof void, uh, leaving gaps around the edge of the lath and plaster ceiling so as not to, to seal it in and provide lighting throughout that, uh, that roof void as well to make it much more accessible, albeit you're still having to, to climb through these amazing timber trusses to be able to do that. Another key consideration on the hall was fire as well, and such an important asset to the, the college didn't have suitable smoke detection or fire prevention within it. So as part of the works, we, uh, we installed lightning protection across the building, trying to hide as much of the, the tape on the rear facing faces of the stone projections and the, uh, the lanterns. And we also installed this aspirator system that you'll see on the, uh, the images. So the, the brains of the system on the, uh, the left hand side, which then has very small perspex tubes, which wind their way out from the system and just poke through the existing opening on the reveals of the lanterns in the main hall in a very sort of short 100 mil projection of, uh, of perspex um, pipe effectively. And, what they do is they sample any air that's coming up to those uh, those tubes, and as soon as smoke is detected within that um, within that air sample, it triggers the uh, the fire alarms. So again, when we're there for the the CFCI dinner, hopefully in November, I very much hope that if we look up, we won't be able to uh, to see those perspex tubes poking through, but they they are there and helping keep the hall safe as well. And we touched earlier on access to the building's gutters and uh, primarily their parapet gutters and the gutters themselves had an awful lot of issues with them. They were set out at bay lengths, which were too long to allow suitably for thermal expansion and contraction. And they fell well outside of the modern guidelines of the Ned Sheet Association. And there were some areas as well where moisture had got in underneath the, uh, the lead and there was no ventilation under there. So you can see on the, the right hand side, one of our discoveries when we finally got access to the parapet gutter around the bay window was to find this sort of rotting timber substrate to some of the lead gutters there. And I vividly remember the first time we got up there and putting a foot on that, uh, that parapet gutter and being immediately aware that something wasn't, uh, wasn't right. So this is the sort of condition that we found with the lead in various places where there hadn't been suitable ventilation installed below. And the geometry of the, the parapet gutters meant that we couldn't achieve the necessary falls and steps and upstands to replace the lead gutters whilst keeping everything below the existing line of the parapet. So we had to look for another solution on this front. And the solution that we arrived at was to use turn-coated stainless steel, which could be rolled out in much longer lengths along the gutter, allowing us to achieve the necessary falls whilst keeping everything below the line of the parapet. So here on the left hand side, you can see the, the very long temporary table that was set up to allow those stainless steel gutters to be formed and then carefully positioned down into the, uh, the recess of the former gutter. And then on the right hand side, the completed gutter fully flashed in with the, uh, the lead work on either side as well. Now, being nearly 200 years old, there were certain areas of stonework on the building which were beginning to, uh, to suffer. So we, we carried out a wide array of stonework repairs. And this included the rebuilding of some particularly exposed sections, such as the turrets, as you can see on the, the left hand side, as well as repairs to the, um, the heavily weathered parapet stones as well. We had Matthew Beasley, who many of you will be familiar with, who was um, working as a subcontractor to Hibbets, who carried out some highly detailed conservation work to the wonderful stone carvings uh, that cover the building. And, and to be honest, getting to see those close up was one of the real pleasures of the, um, the project. They're a really wonderful demonstration of the, the craftsmanship and the skill that went into the original building. One of the issues that we faced was the lack of availability of good quality Ketten stone from which the original building was made. Um, Ketten is an oolitic limestone, which has this lovely texture to it, which is like very, very fine polystyrene balls all tightly packed together. 
but good quality new ketan is almost impossible to find unless you have an existing store of the stone kept aside somewhere. So we therefore progressed um, after conversations with conservation officers and the kibbits as well with an Ancaster stone to try and tie in as closely as possible with the existing Ketan stone. And because we had these two contrasting uh, levels of visibility between the front elevation and the rear face of the building, we had a, a degree of flexibility in terms of where to use the new stone and where to use old. So for example, where we had whole stone replacements on the rear elevation of the building, the sound parts of any removed stone could be cut down and then reused to replace and repair smaller elements on the front elevation. And in that way, it meant we could maintain more of the original fabric on the front elevation where it's most clearly viewed. And then finally, the one of the main defining features of Wilkins Hall is its diminishing course slate roof, where you have very large format slates at the, the eaves of the roof that then get smaller to very small slates up at the top of it, which really adds to the sense of perspective and grandeur to the building when you look at it from afar. And from what we could tell, some of the slates on the roof were original, so obviously well beyond their lifespan. And there was evidence as well, as you can see on the right hand side of some re-roofing that happened in 1897, which again would put it well beyond the, um, the likely lifespan of, um, of some slates. We're, we're not certain who TW or ER were, but we're very grateful for them having inscribed that, uh, that slate back in 1897 to let us know when that, um, that work had taken place. So whether to try and weave in suitable existing slates from the roof into the re-roofing was a difficult decision. And in the end, given the, the complexity involved with accessing the roof for the works, um, primarily the scaffolding complexity and costs and the likes, and the short lifespan of the remaining slates that were in place, we felt we needed to pursue a lower risk option and re-roof the hall in its entirety. And we were able to source new slates from the same Welsh quarry as the original slates, so we could be sure of the same visual match and could guarantee the waterproofing of the hall, which had started to fail, obviously, for many more decades to come. And then the final element of our, our work externally was to install PV panels on the south-facing roof slope of the hall. Typically getting uh, planning and listed building consent to do this on a, a grade one listed building would be extremely challenging. But however, as we've noted, the south face of Wilkins Hall looks onto a service yard and as such is very different in its nature from the, the north elevation, which overlooks front court. And in fact, as part of the, the planning and listed building consent applications, we carried out a, a study to see where the south facing roof slope was visible from other than a handful of locations within the college and found that it really wasn't visible from anywhere other than those internal locations. So as such, the unique arrangement of the hall allowed us to gain permission for the PV array, which is now operational and feeding into the college's network and will hopefully be the first of several such instalments across the college. So that's a very high level overview of the, the history of Wilkins Hall and the challenges that we faced and the solutions we arrived at. And at this point, I'd like to hand over to Steve Allen and Dan Ball from our main contractor, RG Carter, to talk us through their work and then on to Jack Clare from Holywell Glass after that. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I was the contracts manager for the Wilkin Halls contract and also played a big part in the planning of the works at tender stage. At King's College, situated in the centre of Cambridge, being enclosed with the river at Cam to the rear and the medieval street of King's Parade to the front, like most colleges that border the river, have their own challenges for access for major building or restoration projects. The challenge for us was how to set up all the welfare requirements and transport and erect design access scaffolding and temporary roof within the great court area facing the chapel with only the Porter's Lodge gateway as the main entrance. We looked, at the, we looked at that main entrance, it became impossible to use a pause log due to the amount of staff and students, doms, and the general public would use that on a daily basis. So that became a no-goer. So we looked at a small area of grassland just in front of the college, next to the, the where you see the, the right-hand slide now, next to the screen, stone screen wall, we decided to erect a tower scaffold there 
with a gantry at the high level that went across into the main courtyard so we could actually put all the scaffolding requirements up onto that gantry before it was moved further down to actually build a Wilgen Hall. The slide on the top right shows the gantry up against the, the screen wall going across to Wilkins where the scaffold was built up higher. That gantry was built four metres wide, which allowed plenty of access and material storage, for all the scaffolding, the boards, the lead when it was available, all the slates and all the materials needed to actually do the work on Wilkins. We then decided then, how, we had another problem then on the south side, of which this basically a light service well, um, we'd had to put a scaffold up there. Access was a problem um, and scaffolding was a problem because it was also where their kitchens was, which was a lightweight um, felt roofing. To access this area, we had to unload the lorry off Trumpington Street, take it through into Jesus Lane, sorry, Kings Lane, into, or into a courtyard, there, the Chedwin courtyard, and then the rise of a tower scaffold and a hacking stairs in the corner by the side of the Keynes building. This allowed the scaffolders to lift up all the scaffolding and boards up to the top over the roof and drop it down into the light well. The design of that particular scaffold was complicated and lots of permissions were had to be gained of which I'm gonna ask Dan later on to explain what they were. As I described, another part of the work was to repair, refurbish and clean the stained glass leaded light windows. However, we were down to provide access along with the protection measures as the college wanted to use the building for students, staffs and Don's meals. This was another challenge that needed to be overcome in working overhead, not only with loose plaster falling due to the nature of the words, but also to the safety of our workforce above. Dan, so, Dan will explain that how we actually managed to get over these problems. But these two photos that you can see in front of you now, one is on the right hand side shows a, shows a birdcase scaffold in place with tower scaffolds on top of it, which give us that extra reach to meet the ceiling. But the actual landing of the birdcage was at a height where Hollywell could actually access the stained glass windows. Later on, the college decorated the underside of it with this white stuff and lit it up so they could still have meals inside there. So the main problem was with us was um, stripping the main roof. Um, the main works involved stripping the roof of slates, putting to one side for reuse and adding 25% of new Welsh slate. The advice was given um, by Welsh slate that the existing slates on the roof had about another 20, 20 year lifespan. So the college decided that they would actually purchase a complete new roof of Welsh slates. Um, and so they did. We was quite lucky with that as a diminishing slate. That the order that was sent to them was also being shared with Trinity Hall in Belfast, who has also got a diminishing slate roof. And, they were and so Welsh slate could actually mine these rather large chunks of slate with the knowledge that they're actually getting two productions out of it. So they would cut and split the slate larger slate coming to us, the off cut would go to Trinity and vice versa, making it very easy for them to actually cut slates and us to get them within four months. But this also added another challenge to us because we now have to remove 100% of the slates to the ground, the old slates, and get rid of them and actually then bring 100% slates new in, which Cause the problem in how we access around Cambridge. Dan will explain how we got over that. The challenge of carrying out the stone repairs, cleaning, gutters, renewal was always going to be a problem. The architect was never able to inspect the north facing chapel side, and there was no access. Drone footage was used to give an idea, an access was provided. And then there was a schedule and the contract was, the schedule was poured out and then their contract was still live and kicking, but we had to absorb all these extra works within our contract. Hibbert Stonemasons under the control of Paul Hibbert was amazingly good at producing the stone replacement in such short spaces of time. They also took on the stone cleaning using the Portis method, along with uh, making and gold gilding the lions and weather vanes on the lanterns carried out by Matthew Beardsley, conservationist specialist. 
Um, interestingly enough, it's reported that two of the lines were missing, which we actually made. And apparently it was a student's prank that they got up there and stole them. I find that hard to believe that they actually got up there and stole two lines, but that is the story. A white roofing carried out the stripping and relaying of the new well slate, along with the stained steel turn gutters and lead bucket, lead bucket gutters to the south side, along with flashings and copper works to the lanterns. Another, another challenge appeared with the PV array panels, panels manufactured for fixing roofs, set points, to setting out of tile battens dimensions that are a standardized slate or tiles, not diminishing. Um, so the equal setting out made them work, but as it's not equal setting out with a diminishing roof, they wouldn't work. So we provide extra support, plus more work was involved in cutting slate and providing to make measured lead around their flashings. The contract did finish late, however, but the end result was very satisfying. For me personally, in reaching semi-retirement, this was a satisfying contract to finish a restoration and conservation career spanning the last 30 years. Thank you very much for listening and I'm going to hand you over to Dan. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, apologies for turning my camera off. Unfortunately, I can only operate with either voice or video due to poor internet connection. Uh, I was the site manager for RG Carters. I managed the project at a site level, so the complications we faced were those unforeseen circumstances due to last minute discoveries, decisions based on sample results and access restrictions meant that we had to plan our days more thoroughly. COVID-19, of course, affected the way the site operated. Now, we had use of a storage compound, as mentioned, on West Road. Um, all our materials were stored here, the old slates after their removal, and the new slates were sorted into their sizes before then being ferrying onto the site. We had a telehandler and a forklift, uh, sorry, a telehandler and a truck um, to move materials back and forth and waste back to site where we had a, a skip. We had to apply to the council for a permit to use a bus gate on Silver Street, as sadly this was closed to the general public shortly before we started works. Carried out all loading and unloading activities early in the morning, um, sometimes with early starts for myself. Uh, due to an anti-terrorist barrier being closed at 9.30 in the morning. Again, this was unforeseen until the site was underway. Two other last minute discoveries were the method of stone cleaning. So following samples offered to the conservation officer, a combination of torque cleaning, steam cleaning, and simply hand brushing to remove moss. Um, the more delicate surfaces was used. A speedy procurement of patinated copper panelling was needed um, after realising that this needed to be replaced to the lowest. Scaffolding was very much a, a long line. Multiple designs needed to further reduce other things without having to drill a single hole in the front of the face of the building. We limited all other tie locations to be out of sight. Pivots then repaired and consolidated these during the strip of the scaffold, achieving an almost invisible finish. The temporary roof and scaffolding to the lanterns, of course, had to be removed after completion. This was a challenge to install, only now they had to walk all over our new slates. We couldn't afford to break any, as these were far from shelf items, with the largest slate measuring two and a half feet wide by four foot tall. They had to stand in the correct locations and dropping tubes and clips were not practical. <laughs> Now, finally, COVID-19, every industry has been affected by this pandemic. We, like many others, had to increase our well facilities, bring into place strict cleaning regimes and monitor and practice social distancing. The nature, however, of the materials we were using, that of high weight and unwieldy items, meant that common practice, multiple person lifts would be used to carry out the lowering of each item into their final locations. Social distancing guidelines prevented this. Instead, we had our scaffolder install a number of lifting beams and hoists as to allow one person to operate and guide each piece of stone, for example, into position, utilizing 100% mechanical lifting aid. Now planning and communication between trades was critical at this stage 
as works could only continue once the lifting aids has been relocated to each item. You can see in the uh, display there that we had our materials hoist varying from the gantry up to north elevation. And we had a similar hoist down from the gantry down into pin parade. Now we did have to reevaluate our program so as to limit the number of people in each work area any one time, but at the same time we didn't have an open ended calendar. We did run over programs slightly, but everybody went home safe. We didn't have any COVID cases on site. All parties were over the moon with the end product. And I think I can speak for everybody in saying that we thoroughly enjoyed the project. Thank you very much. And I'll hand you back to Alistair. Thanks, Dan. So one of the final and most eye-catching parts of the work was the conservation of the, um, the amazing stained glass uh, windows that you'll find in the hall. So I'm going to pass over to, to Jack Claire now, who I think you can actually just see in this, uh, this image on the left there, poking his head through the, the glass during work. So he's going to show us uh, through his presentation. So Jack, I'll just stop sharing and uh, hand that over to you. Lovely. All right. There we are. You should be able to see my screen now, I hope. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm Jack Clare. I was tasked with um, overseeing the stained glass conservation at Wilkins Hall. Uh, a, a very brief introduction of us. Uh, we are uh, specialists in the conservation of historic glass from medieval up to 20th century works of art. Um, we are the the only royally appointed stained glass studio, um, the first in over a hundred years, and um, so we are lucky enough to work on a great number of the nation's great cathedrals, churches, country houses, and indeed uh, Oxford and Cambridge colleges. Um, so you get to go and get in some pretty unique positions uh, in our field. Um, so this is from a, a hoist in the. The chapel opposite Wilkins Hall, um, one of the nation's great treasures, um, as much glass as stonework, um, nearly all um, original Tudor scheme with the uh, just dazzling array of light coming through and playing around the, the chapel there. And uh, just down the road, the east window at Peterhouse, the oldest of the Cambridge colleges, um, which we uh, which we conserved uh, 2019 to 20. Um, so first I'm gonna talk you through uh, the raw material of handmade glass because um, the, the process of actually making it and then I'll talk you through the stages we went through in the conservation of the, the Wilkins Hall glass. So there's, there's two main types I should say. There's, there's crown glass and cylinder glass found in Wilkins Hall. So first the crown method, um, the, the glass blower will get a gather of molten glass on the blowpipe, um, open the end up with a, uh, a metal tool um, so you get this bowl shape and then he will spin it um, sometimes to the side, sometimes above his head which is uh, as dangerous as it sounds um, to, and the centrifugal force will throw it outward giving you a great disc of glass. Um, it gives fantastic clarity because uh, at no point in the manufacture is the glass in contact with another surface and that's a that's a really small one they did them up to six feet in diameter so yeah pretty hairy thing to be doing and it's a uh, it's a skill which has been lost unfortunately there's nowhere in the world currently making crown glass which is a, a real shame um, and the other method is is cylinder glass which uh, again you get a molten gather of glass on the blowpipe blow air into it to form a cavity open the end up and uh, I'm just going to flick onto a video so you can see hopefully you can all see that um, and the guy is uh, swinging uh, over a great pit uh, and gravity elongates the cylinder and he has to reintroduce the cylinder to the furnace to keep it in a semi-molten state and constantly turn it so uh, otherwise it would slump to one side with with gravity so it's a real physical thing and uh, an incredible skill as well um, um, once that has been 
done. The cylinders are knocked from the blowpipe um, and you're left with, with these. And as they uh, are taken away from the blowpipe, they're scored along their full length. And uh, as they core, you can see the ones against the stone pillar there, they, they uh, split apart just by a couple of inches lengthways uh, as they contract. Um, then it's, these cylinders are then put through a second furnace, which is called a Lear, to get out any imperfections, any air bubbles, which could cause it to uh, spontaneously break over time, which obviously you don't want. Um, and at this stage, it's flattened as well. So it's first teased out with a metal tool and then ironed flat with a block of cherry wood. And you can see the, the vat of water the guy's got there, and he has to constantly dip his block of cherry wood in to stop it singeing. Um, so that's the that's the raw material. The the process of glass blowing and stained glass manufacture have always been separate. I don't think there's ever been a company particularly renowned for both. Um, so then you come along to the art form of stained glass, and this is a uh, a twen early twentieth century studio, um, and you can see designers various with full scale cartoons drawn up from templates uh, taken from buildings, uh, which they can then. Um, glass can be selected for and uh, then it's hand painted and and kiln fired to produce the end effect. Um, so I'll talk you through the process we undergo in the, the conservation, underwent in the conservation of the Wilkins Hall glass. Um, so first of all you have, uh, uh, some of you will know stained glass windows, the glass is held together by a matrix of lead work. Um, uh, early medieval lead was was actually cast, but um, glass uh, lead work of the age of Wilkins Hall, which is 1830s, by a, a guy called John Pike Hedgeland. Um, that that was by that time uh, all milled, um, and uh, occasionally you're lucky enough to you get the mill marks. You can see the the lines, and you're occasionally lucky enough to get a, a date on the the wheels of the mill. So that's 1851. Um, unfortunately. Not so in the case of Wilkins, but um, it, it was fairly evident from the condition that uh, the vast majority was original. Um, so that we then have to form a, a pre-conservation document for each panel that we remove from the building and decide how much of the lead we can actually retain. Um, we try and conserve all the historic lead uh, as far as practical, but we have to have, uh, it also has to serve its purpose of uh, supporting the window and uh, if, if it buckles and bows too much it can cause further damage to the the glass and cause breakages so that's uh sorry that back to that slide is a uh, the first process before we look at dismantling any panels we have to take a wax rubbing of the the lead work we take we actually take two one to lay the glass out on so we know where it all goes and um the second one to re-lead on and there you can see a panel partially dismantled, the lower half in, in, in original lead, the top part um, dismantled from its lead work on the, the rubbing there. And then, uh, then we undertake the cleaning of the glass, which um, this is a dramatic example of 13th century glass from Norbury Church in Derbyshire, which was covered in algae, just in, incredible layers. Um, Thankfully, the, the Wilkins Hall glass wasn't quite this bad. It was it was sooty, but not um, not green, which was nice. And um, the solution we employed uh, a wet clean with on cotton wool swabs with 50-50 uh, ethanol and deionized water. And that, that's aided by binocular microscope as well to ensure none of the painted detail uh, gets lost. Um, and obviously, these windows um, sustain damage over the, the centuries. So when we've got breaks, we, we obviously don't just replace glass willy nilly. We try and keep as much as we possibly can. So one method of repair is the copper foil technique, adhesive back copper foil applied to the two edges of a break and soldered to form in effect a mini lead, which is very inconspicuous. So there's a pain from uh, Wilkins Hall and that's it, top left, post-conservation photograph. You can see the copper foil string running through the middle there. Um, if you've got more severe breaks, you might, uh, copper foils might look a bit incongruous with uh, a spider web of lines. So that's from a, a church in Froome in Somerset, uh, sustained an air gun pellet from a, 
local lad and uh, we employed a, an epoxy resin edge bond for that one, which um, the conservation grade resins for glassware have the same refractive index as glass and can be dyed using uh, aerosol dyes. So you can achieve a, a near impossible, uh, near invisible, sorry, um, repair. If we look at um, the the painted detail now, um, this is, it's gone through various um, changes over time. So this is a, a 15th century wonderful head of uh, St. Catherine from the clear story of Winchester Cathedral. You can see the, the simplicity but great beauty of it. Um, the silver nitrate painted onto the glass, known as silver stain in the industry for the crown and hair. Um, and that's that actually chemically reacts when kiln fired and the yellow you see um, is actually in the body of the glass. And the line work of the face and the shading is in glass paint, which is just ground glass and metal oxides. Slightly later, Tudor glass from the vine in Hampshire. You can see the painting styles developed and um, you can also see a blush around the lips and cheeks of the figure. And uh, that's actually enamel, which is, comes in in the 16th century. And then 1830s, Hedgeland from Wilkins Hall, heavy use of enamel, wonderful, wonderful figurative painting. And uh, all of the background gray blue you see is, um, is actually enamel work stippled. The tools of the trade for a glass painter. So you've got badger brushes on the left for matting, um, riggers for line work, mops on the right for uh, areas of shading and um, uh, stipplers and sponges, which you can create various effects with. And uh, each uh, our studio keeps uh, hundreds and hundreds of various sample slides, so we can recreate historic paint detail really accurately and know the correct recipes that we need to use. That's my colleague Helen repainting some paints for a church on Guernsey. Um, we are faced with some ethical dilemmas. So um, uh, quite quite obviously, the the top left pane there is a, a later replacement, um, and we have to decide based on age, artistic merit, um, various considerations whether to retain these. And in in the vast majority of cases, we do. Um, However, when you get something like that, which so obviously detracts from the original design intent, um, we do occasionally decide to recreate paints. Um, the line work and silver stain tone on that paint were actually really good, um, but the, the shading is obviously way too dark. So instead of just throwing that away, we decided to actually acid etch the painted detail away so it leaves the silver stain behind because it's in the body of the glass as I mentioned before and we can just retain the glass it's got the original silver stain and um, recreate the shading uh, of the surrounding panes that we've got so that's an original on the right and the repaint on the left and the post conservation photograph which um, is uh, a lot less noticeable obviously uh, this was a particularly troublesome one. So there are five very prominent panes um, in completely the wrong glass selection, wrong line work, wrong, wrong silverstone tone. Um, you can see the, the scroll works all in that um, plummy pink colour, which is completely uh, at odds with its neighbours. Um, so we, again, we chose to, um, that's it top left, you can see it in comparison with its neighbours. So with such clear evidence of what the panes should appear, um, we decided to recreate them. Um, so that's a before and after photograph and it back in situ, uh, top left. Um, once we've done any repaints, the, the panels can be pieced back together. So that's my colleague, Joe. Um, you can see the new lead, the brighter silver um, neighbor in the old, which, um, you just have to clean the old back to bright metal to solder to. And uh, obviously the openings at Wilkins are quite unique in that they are into a steel frame, which is in a groove into the stonework of the mullions and jams. Um, so we template incredibly accurately with, with um, less than two mil tolerance all the way around following the various undulations of the frame and how it's corroded over the years. 
and it was made more complex because we didn't just have horizontal divisions in the panels. Each of these lights are in three different panels. They actually were shaped. You can see that's curved and then the base of the heraldry above slots in. Um, so they've got to be incredibly accurately made and pieced together as one in the workshop. And generally we fix to stonework with lime mortars. Um, but in this case, you've got a rebate on the metal frames of one to two millimeters max. Um, so that has to be fixed with glazing putty and uh, the panels have to be made to fit very, very accurately. Um, the tie bars you see that support the panels uh, were all um, ferrous on the uh, south elevation. So they were all replaced for phosphor bronze. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you very much and uh, welcome any questions. Thank you, Jack. I don't know if you want to stop sharing, if you can do that. Uh, yes, I yeah. can. Um, stop share. There we go. Well, um, there was a few questions that came up on the chat, but I've got a, a couple of mine before we do that. Uh, I, I'm interested to know how the meeting went when you decided about putting a crash deck in uh, Wilkins Hall and uh, the risk and reward of being able to still have dinner and, and meals in there uh, whilst you're putting in a crash deck. So who, who made that call? That one went back and forth an awful lot, to be honest. Um, I remember an original design for the crash deck, which got tabled to the college's um, conference team. Um, and to be honest, it was pretty unpalatable to them. This was pre-COVID. We were trying as a whole on the project to, to have everything lined up a year in advance of the work starting. So. COVID wasn't really a, a thing at that point, and we looked into various other methods of safely being able to remove slates and the likes from the roof above without having a crash deck within the hall. Obviously, then COVID landed, and suddenly the um, yeah the events that would have been taking place underneath the uh, the works were no longer taking place. So that um, that changed things. So something which was very much not part of the project then returned to being very much part of the project so it did sort of oscillate an awful lot through the um um yeah through the duration of the project and largely because of the impact of, of covid um we ended up having that um that crash deck in place but i think without it we would have had to go for a, a slightly more elaborate um solution well it's not often i look at these um zoom meetings and go wow inwardly but when i saw the the picture of below and above the crash deck, I thought, blimey, I can't imagine how that, I, I couldn't have imagined it. Um, I, I'm, I'm guessing this was a traditional JCT type contract. Um, but I probably, I probably, well, I imagine Alistair as the contract administrator and Carter's as the contractor. Um, how, how did you, how did you work out a price and a program before you started on this job? Yeah, well, we weren't the, um, the contract administrators for it. So um, Faithful and Gold were taking on that, um, that job for us. So we were, to be honest, it worked quite well. We could concentrate on site inspections and addressing anything that was found on site. And, and F&G took care of the, um, yeah, the contract administration side and issuing instructions and the like. So, um, Dan and Steve, you might be best placed to, um, to answer that one in terms of the, um, yeah, the arriving at the, the contract sum. Okay, yes. Um, in arriving at the contract sum, we actually won the job by default because we didn't win the job at tender stage. We were actually second. And they came back to us, the college, after six months because the tenders who'd won it uh, decided they perhaps can't do it. So they asked us to come in there. So when we actually priced the job, um, we priced the job in the fact that we probably knew we were going to get extras out of it, to be honest, because Alistair <laughs> couldn't actually give us a precise document uh, as a bill of quantities because he hadn't been up there to be able to survey the north side at all. So there was a little, from my point of view and the company's point of view, there was going to be a little bit of leverage going on there at a risk to us because the risk to us was actually setting the site up rather than the actual works, to be fair. So, yeah, we did make some assumptions and ended up winning the job. There's an honest answer from a contractor. I like that. <laughs> there was going to be some variations. I like the idea of that. Um, a couple of questions from, from the chat. Uh, when you were going through the, uh, the gutter design and all the replacement and the work you had to do, um, how did you factor in 
you know, climate change and the torrential downpours we seem to get now every every couple of years. Mm. Yeah, the um, the gutters were a really interesting one, and eventually had to be sort of exposed fully on site before we could reach the um, final conclusion on it. Um, Width-wise for the gutter, they were constrained between the, the brickwork and the stone of the parapet wall. And then there was a rather substantial um, eaves beam effectively, which was supported off the, um, the trusses within the roof, which again, couldn't be moved. So width-wise, we were quite constrained. Um, with the change to stainless steel gutters from lead, we no longer had the, um, the steps and the loss of sort of 50 or 60 mil every few, um, few meters or so. So it meant we could achieve a, um, a larger sort of depth effectively to those um those gutters than would have previously been the um been the case um i don't think i can honestly say that that was a response to um you know predicted larger and heavier rainfalls but we were able to gain a, a volume for that gutter from the change in material that was much larger than what was there previously so we'll have a degree of future proofing to it in that respect but but it, but it stood the test of the of the storms we've had in the last six months, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it's done all right on, the, on that front so far. Um, I noticed when you said that you, you'd exposed some of the um, rotten timbers, uh, were there other structural repairs you had to do or was it mostly in the roof where you had the, the rotten timbers? Yeah, the rotten timbers were isolated to the um, the gutters around the dome. They had a slightly different construction. So they had a, a solid sort of sub base effectively that that timber then was on top of with no sort of air movement around it and then the lead on top of that. So that was the only place that we uncovered rotten timbers, I think because of the unique sort of construction of the bay in relation to, to everywhere else. Um, Dan, from memory, we had very limited structural repairs on the building other than where we were cutting out for um uh, for access hatches so obviously there was a bit of work there but um can you recall anything further on that one dan so where we opened up i think we had the, the number of hatches to the south the timbers that were removed from there were then used to be relocated in a, a rotten timbers location it was very small quantity of, of rot to the the main rafters and the, the main fabric of the building. So the, the building had stood up pretty well? It had, yes. Um, there's a question here on getting planning permission to put PVs on a grade one listed building. And other, is, this, is this a first for Cambridge or are there other examples? I, I know from something I did in the past mm -hmm. that Chapel Court at Jesus has got um, solar panels, albeit I think that's grade two rather than grade one listed. So Alistair, is, 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 grade, is, this the, is this a first for Cambridge, grade one listing PVs on the roof? It's a first for us in Cambridge. Um, I'd be really interested to know if anybody's aware of another example of a, a grade one listed building. I mean, obviously we had a very unique set of circumstances. Um, that's what we spoke about with the differing natures of the front and the rear elevation, but- I'm seeing something done... great, uh, so great St. Mary says PVs is what um, I'm reading as on the chat, it comes in. Excellent. Well, that's that's good to know. How, right. How was, how was it received it. when you first said we'd like to put some PVs on the um on this roof? How did I the construction officer respond to that? That bit was slightly earlier than my time, but the I think there was a useful conversation about the um how we would demonstrate the lack of of detrimental impact effectively on the grade one listed building. And that study of views up to that roof was quite critical in that case, demonstrating that it could only be seen effectively from the, the internal corridors of the Keynes building, looking across the service yard up onto that roof. And to be honest, even from some of the lower floors, it's very hard to see it from there as well. So the um, the idea obviously wasn't sort of um, batted away um, immediately. There was a, there was the, the scope to have a conversation with it and to present a, an argument which could um, yeah give some, some weight and some justification for doing it in that particular location. I think you might be muted, James. Muted, yeah, I'm unmuting now. Um, another question on that, that famous question of, if you had your time again, what would you do differently? You know, what lessons did you learn? And I, you know, I, I, I might hear from Jack when he's saying, saying how he, they decided they were going to um, take a panel and redo it because it was clearly not in keeping with it. But was, it, was there anything else where you've gone, um, I wish we'd started this again? No, not really. I mean, I, I highlighted those pains. That's 
six panes of um, thousands that we had in the workshop. So um, it, it's nice to highlight where you can um, have a, a, a great visual um, improvement. Um, but no, in the main, it's, it's true conservation. It's every part of the fabric that we can keep, we do keep. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, all of the decisions are, are informed by a condition survey from a hoist undertaken prior to the work. So it's, it's maybe one aspect of the works that we were fairly certain that um, there wouldn't be huge variation. We, we'd been up there, we knew what condition it was in. So um, I, I can't see any great uh, ways we could have made strides on what, what we did and hopefully it'll uh, set the windows up for, for uh, generations to come to enjoy. Certainly looks like it. Uh, Alistair, was there anything that Purcell would um, consider revisiting on a different job? Yeah, I think we we have to. It's probably what Steve touched on in terms of the um, the greater degree of certainty you can give the client about costs and scope of works in advance of, of starting work on site. So in, in more recent projects, we've used um, uh, more use of drone surveys and rectified photography and the likes, which which still isn't without its its limits, but it can give slightly more accurate um, forecasts. So we had to. Um, I think effectively was surveying what we could from from ground level and from accessible locations and then having to make estimates based on previous job experience for for quantities of different sorts of repairs but i think now that we're adopting more sort of drone based surveys we could have reduced that uncertainty a little bit more so i think that's probably the um the main one that i'd take away from it okay well we've got one minute before our our time is up um i'd like to thank you on behalf of everyone who's listened and watched and on behalf of CS CFCI for a, like I say, some eye-opening visuals and some things I'd never thought I'd see in some of the buildings and there's such a famous building in this in Cambridge and, and thank you again and um, uh, I welcome everybody back to the next CFCI talk very soon but thank you again to the panellists and um, have a good evening and good afternoon. Thanks very much, bye-bye.